The ECG is an essential tool in diagnosing heart conditions, but interpreting it correctly requires both skill and a systematic approach. In this session, we'll focus on recognizing ischemia and infarction, learning to identify STEMI and NSTEMI, localize infarcts, and distinguish high-risk patterns like Wellens syndrome and posterior MI. Beyond infarction, we'll also explore how bundle branch blocks, fascicular blocks, and rate-related conduction abnormalities affect ECG interpretation. Understanding these patterns is critical for making quick, accurate clinical decisions and avoiding misdiagnosis. Every ECG provides valuable insights. Our job is to decode them with precision. Let's get started. Understanding Myocardial Ischemia Myocardial ischemia results from an oxygen supply-demand mismatch, causing metabolic and electrical disturbances. It shortens the action potential, lowers resting membrane potential, and disrupts depolarization and repolarization, leading to ST segment deviations, T wave changes, and in prolonged cases, Q waves signaling irreversible damage. Voltage gradient in ischemia. ECG changes arise from electrical imbalances between ischemic and healthy myocardium, generating injury currents that alter conduction and cause ST segment shifts. These patterns help differentiate ischemia from infarction and localize the affected region. ST deviation in ischemia. ST elevation indicates acute transmural ischemia, or complete occlusion, while ST depression suggests subendocardial ischemia or partial occlusion or demand ischemia. ST elevation requires urgent reperfusion, whereas ST depression necessitates further assessment. Transmural versus subendocardial ischemia. Ischemia affects the myocardium in different ways. Transmural ischemia, or STEMI, I involves the full thickness of the myocardial wall, leading to an outward shift in the electrical vector, producing ST elevation. This indicates complete coronary occlusion and necessitates immediate reperfusion therapy. Subendocardial ischemia, or NSTEMI, is limited to the inner myocardial layers, shifting the electrical vector inward, resulting in ST depression. This pattern suggests partial coronary obstruction, often requiring intensive medical management rather than immediate reperfusion. Current of injury in acute ischemia. The current of injury describes the altered electrical activity in ischemic myocardial tissue. In subendocardial ischemia, this current is directed toward the ventricular cavity, causing ST depression in corresponding leads. In transmural ischemia, it shifts outward toward the epicardium, resulting in ST elevation. Understanding this principle is fundamental in diagnosing and differentiating between STEMI and NSTEMI, guiding urgent therapeutic decisions. Localizing myocardial infarction. ECG changes provide insight into the anatomical location of myocardial infarction, correlating with specific coronary artery involvement. Anterior MI, marked by lead V1 to V6, lead 1 and AVL, suggests left anterior descending artery or LAD occlusion, often associated with large infarct size and significant complications. Inferior MI, denoted by lead 2, 3 and AVF, typically indicates right coronary artery or left circumflex occlusion and may be complicated by AV conduction disturbances. Posterior MI is inferred from ST depression in V1 to V3 and confirmed by posterior leads, V7 to V9, revealing ST elevation. Right ventricular MI presents with ST elevation in right-sided leads, V3R to V6R, often coexisting with inferior MI, requiring distinct management considerations. Precise localization aids in determining infarct severity and predicting potential complications, ensuring targeted therapeutic strategies. Evolution of myocardial infarction on ECG. Myocardial infarction progresses through distinct ECG phases. In the hyperacute phase, within minutes to hours, peaked T waves and ST elevation appear. 
the acute phase, within hours to days, shows persistent ST elevation and emerging Q waves, signaling necrosis. During the subacute phase, within days to weeks, ST segments return to baseline, and T wave inversion becomes prominent. In the chronic phase, within weeks to months, Q waves persist as markers of prior infarction, while T waves may normalize. Identifying these phases helps assess infarct timing and guide management. Subacute and chronic phases of myocardial infarction. As infarction evolves beyond the acute stage, ST segments gradually normalize, while deep T wave inversion reflects ongoing remodeling. In the chronic phase, persistent Q waves confirm irreversible damage, though T wave changes may resolve. Persistent inversion may indicate residual ischemia, requiring further evaluation. These ECG changes differentiate recent infarcts from prior cardiac events. Anterior infarction, due to LAD occlusion, presents with ST elevation in lead V1 to V6, lead 1, and AVL, with reciprocal ST depression in inferior leads. Over time, Q waves develop and T waves become deeply inverted. Given its extensive myocardial involvement, anterior MI increases the risk of ventricular arrhythmias, cardiogenic shock, and left ventricular failure, necessitating urgent intervention. Inferior wall infarction. Inferior infarction caused by RCA or LCX occlusion presents with ST elevation in 2, 3, and AVF with reciprocal ST depression in lead 1 and AVL. It often affects the AV node, predisposing patients to bradyarrhythmias and AV block. Right ventricular infarction should be suspected, as it requires fluid resuscitation while avoiding nitrates and preload-reducing agents. Posterior wall infarction. Since the standard ECG does not directly capture posterior infarction, it is inferred from ST depression in V1 to V3, representing a mirror image of posterior ST elevation. Tall R waves in these leads also suggest posterior involvement. Leads V7 to V9 should be recorded to confirm the diagnosis and ensure appropriate treatment. Right ventricular infarction or RVI, right ventricular infarction, often associated with inferior MI due to proximal RCA occlusion, is confirmed by ST elevation in V1 and right-sided leads. V3R to V6R. Unlike left-sided infarctions, RVI requires fluid resuscitation to maintain preload, while nitrates and diuretics should be avoided to prevent hypotension. Prompt recognition is crucial, as hemodynamic instability is common. Q-wave versus non-Q-wave infarction. Q-wave infarctions were traditionally linked to transmural MI while non-Q-wave infarctions suggested subendocardial involvement. However, Q-waves can form in both types, making infarct depth assessment unreliable without additional clinical and biomarker evaluation. Modern diagnosis relies on ST segment changes and troponin levels. Wellens syndrome. A critical pattern. Wellens syndrome signals critical proximal LAD stenosis and a high risk of extensive anterior MI. ECG findings include biphasic T waves, that is type A, or deep, symmetric T wave inversions, that is type B, in V2, V3. Unlike acute MI, there is no significant ST elevation, and biomarkers may be normal. Early recognition is crucial, as these patients require urgent angiography to prevent major infarction. Limitations of ECG in diagnosing myocardial infarction a normal ECG does not exclude MI, as ischemic changes may appear only with serial recordings. LBBB, pacemaker rhythms, and WPW can mask infarction, while conditions like pericarditis and LVH can mimic STEMI. ECG findings should always be correlated with clinical presentation, biomarkers, and imaging. Differential diagnosis of ST elevation ischemic causes. ST elevation is most commonly seen in STEMI, but can also result from other ischemic conditions. Prince metals angina causes transient ST elevation due to coronary vasospasm, while Takotsubo syndrome mimics STEMI with ST elevation and troponin rise, but without obstructive CAD.
Distinguishing these conditions is crucial as their management differs from STEMI. Differential Diagnosis of ST Elevation, Non-Ischemic Causes Several non-ischemic conditions can produce ST elevation, requiring careful differentiation from acute MI. Pericarditis presents with diffuse ST elevation and PR depression, while LVH and LBBB can distort ST segments. Brugada syndrome causes COVID ST elevation in V1 to V3 and is associated with ventricular arrhythmias. Electrolyte imbalances, hypothermia, and CNS events can also alter ECG patterns, necessitating comprehensive evaluation. Differentiating STEMI from pericarditis Although both STEMI and pericarditis cause ST elevation, key differences help distinguish them. STEMI produces localized convex ST elevation with reciprocal changes and evolving Q waves. In contrast, pericarditis presents with diffuse ST elevation and PR depression without reciprocal ST depression. Unlike STEMI, pericarditis is often positional and relieved by sitting forward, preventing unnecessary emergent reperfusion therapy. Bundle branch blocks or BBBs result from delayed or blocked conduction through the specialized ventricular conduction pathways, altering both depolarization and repolarization patterns. Right bundle branch block or RBBB is often benign but may indicate pulmonary or structural heart disease, while left bundle branch block or LBBB is more concerning, often signifying underlying ischemia, hypertension, or cardiomyopathy. BBBs widen the QRS complex that is more than and equal to 120 milliseconds and produce secondary STT wave changes, complicating ECG interpretation, particularly in the context of suspected myocardial infarction. Right bundle branch, or RBBB. RBBB is identified by the characteristic RSR dash or rabbit ears pattern in V1, V3, a wide S wave in leads 1 and V6, and secondary T-wave inversions in right precordial leads. While RBBB may be seen in healthy individuals, it can also indicate pulmonary embolism, congenital heart disease, as like atrial septal defect, or right ventricular hypertrophy. When RBBB occurs acutely in a patient with chest pain, concurrent ischemic changes should be carefully assessed for signs of infarction. LBBB presents with a broad, notched R wave in leads 1, AVL, and V5V6, the absence of Q waves in lateral leads, and discordant STT wave changes. It is often associated with coronary artery disease, hypertension, or structural heart disease. In the setting of acute chest pain, new or presumed new LBBB can obscure STEMI, necessitating the use of Scarbossa criteria to identify infarction-related changes. LBBB and myocardial infarction Scarbossa criteria Diagnosing STEMI In the presence of LBBB is challenging, as the altered ventricular activation distorts normal ischemic patterns. Scarbossa criteria provide a systematic approach. ST elevation more than an equal to 1 mm, concordant with QRS in any lead. It's highly specific for MI. ST depression more than and equal to 1 mm in V1 to V3. It suggests posterior infarction. ST elevation more than and equal to 5 mm discordant with QRS. It's less specific but suggestive. A modified version improves sensitivity by incorporating a proportional STS ratio of more than and equal to 25%, further refining the identification of infarction in LBBB. Fascicular blocks. Fascicular blocks occur when conduction is delayed or blocked in the anterior or posterior fascicles of the left bundle branch. Left anterior fascicular block or LAFB is the most common, producing a left axis deviation, small Q waves in LED1, AVL, and small R waves in 2, 3, AVF. Left posterior fascicular block or LPFB is rarer and manifests as right axis deviation with opposite ECG findings. Fascicular blocks often indicate underlying structural heart disease and may precede more advanced conduction disturbances. Bifascicular and trifascicular blocks. 
A bifascicular block involves RBBB combined with either LAFB or LPFB. While often asymptomatic, it may progress to complete heart block, particularly in the setting of ischemia or acute infarction. Trifascicular block, which includes bifascicular block plus first-degree AV block, suggests widespread conduction system disease and often warrants consideration for permanent pacemaker implantation. Bundle branch blocks can be rate-dependent, appearing only when the heart rate exceeds a certain threshold due to conduction system refractoriness. This phenomenon is commonly seen during exercise testing, tachyrrhythmias, or stress-induced states and may indicate underlying conduction disease, even in the absence of permanent bundle branch block. In this session, we've strengthened our ability to recognize ischemia and infarction on ECG, learning how to identify STEMI and NSTEMI, locate infarcts, and spot high-risk patterns like Wellens syndrome and posterior MI. These skills are critical for making fast, accurate decisions in cardiac emergencies. But ECG interpretation doesn't stop here. In upcoming sessions, we'll explore pacemaker rhythms, electrolyte imbalances, drug effects on ECG, and conditions like Brugada and Long QT syndrome. These findings are just as important in diagnosing and managing heart conditions. An ECG is more than just waves and lines. It tells a story. Our job is to read it correctly. Stay with us as we continue mastering this essential skill. ECG interpretation isn't just about detecting heart attacks. It helps us understand a wide range of heart and body conditions. In this session, we'll move beyond ischemia to explore advanced ECG patterns that provide key medical insights.